What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another audiobook. Now, we are about a week away from Felix the Shark coming out, which is the last book in the series. Uh, and the only book that I haven't covered yet is, in fact, Fetch. So we are going through this now. I'm personally really excited because Fetch is one of, well, it's it's a really good book. It's a really good book. I wouldn't say it's one of the best, but I think it's it's pretty solid. Um, it's not bad <laughs> in terms of uh, all of the all of the books. It's it's pretty good, um, especially the first story, Fetch, which we are reading today. Uh, I'm very excited for this one. Uh, as I say, I have read this one before, so it's not going to be a reaction induced one. Um, but yeah, we, let's get straight into it. Really, um, I am going to enjoy this a lot. Uh, as you can see, there are highlighters, highlighter markings. That's just because the first time I read this, I was highlighting things. Uh, I uh, I don't know how to turn it off, so yeah. <laughs> it's just going to have to stay, so I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, let's get straight into this. The surf, the wind, and the rain were at war, battering against the old building, so forcefully Greg wondered if its crumbling walls could stand against them. When the bawling thunder blasted the boarded-up window again, Greg jumped back, stumbling into Cyril and thromping and tromping on his th on his foot. <laughs> Not thromping. Uh, Ow! Cyril shoved Greg, jabbing his flashlight spastically at the wall in front of them. The light scanned over drooping sections of blue-striped wallpaper and what looked like two red letters, F R. Streaks of something dark sprayed over the stripes. Was that pizza sauce or something else? Hady laughed at his two bumbling friends. It's just the wind, guys. Suck it up. Another gust hit the building and the walls shuddered, drowning out Hady's voice. The rain pounded on the metal roof, ratcheted up. Oh, the, the rain pounding on the metal roof ratcheted up. God. Uh, but inside the building close by, something metallic clinked loud enough to be heard over the wind and rain. What was that? Cyril whirled and swung his flashlight in a wild arc. At barely 13, Cyril was a year younger than Greg and Hady. Though still in their fledging freshman class, he was short and skinny, with boyish features and limp brown hair, and he had the misfortune of sounding like a cartoon mouse. It didn't win him many friends. Okay, so I've got, I've got to do a cartoon mouse, do I? Let's go check out the old pizzeria! <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'll just do that voice, even though it doesn't really sound like a cartoon mouse. Cyril mimicked Greg's suggestion. Yeah, this is a great idea. It was a crisp autumn night, and the seaside town was dark, robbed of power by the later storm's assault. Greg and his friends had planned a Saturday night of gaming and, and junk food, my favourite. But as soon as the power went out, Haley's parents tried to recruit them for a board game. The family's tradition during power outages. Haley had convinced his parents to let the boys bike the short distance to Greg's house, where they could play one of Greg's new tabletop strategy games instead. But once there, Greg enlisted them to go to the pizzeria. For days he'd known he had to do this. It was like he was drawn to this place. Or maybe he had it all wrong. This could be a wild goose chase. Greg shined his flashlight around the corridor. They just explored the kitchen of the abandoned restaurant and it had been shocked to find it was still stocked with pots, pans and dishes. Who closed a pizzeria and left all that stuff behind? After they left the kitchen, they found themselves next to a large stage at one end of what had once been the main eating area of the de derelict pizzeria. None of the boys had volunteered to see what was behind the curtain, and none of them had mentioned seeing the curtain move when they passed the stage. Haley laughed again. Better than hanging with the fam. Hey, what's that? What's what? Cyril aimed his light in the direction of Haley's gaze. Greg turned his flashlight that way too, toward the far corner of the large table-filled room they stood in. The glowing beam landed on a row of hulking shapes lined up against uh, along a murky glass counter. Bright eyes refle reflected the light back at them from across the room. Cool, Haley said, kicking aside a broken table leg as he made his way toward the counter. Maybe, Greg thought, frowning at the eyes. One pair seemed to be staring right at him. Despite the confidence he'd felt before, he was beginning to wonder what exactly he was doing here. Haley approached the counter first. This is dope. He reached for something and sneezed when dust billowed up from the stand. 
Before they left his house, Craig had suggested they all take handkerchiefs to cover their noses and mouths, but he couldn't find any. Weird question, is handkerchiefs not spelt with a V? Is it not C-H-I-E-V-E-S? No, that sounds even more wrong. I don't even know. Um, he expected to find the empty restaurant filled with dust, mould, mildew, and who else? Who, who knew what else? Surprisingly, given the wet coastal climate, the only decay they'd seen was dust, but there was a lot of dust. Greg stepped around an overturned metal chair and passed Cyril, who had his back pressed to a dirty, paint-peeled pillar in the middle of the dining area. Other than one broken table and two upside-down chairs, the area looked like it was... Uh, the area looked like it just needed a heavy cleaning before it could be fit for diners, which again was strange. Greg had known something would be here, but he didn't expect the building to still hold dishes and furniture and... What else? Greg looked at what Haley held, and he, stu and he sucked in his breath. Was this what he'd come for? Was this why the old place was calling to him? What is it? Cyril asked, not moving any closer to the counter. I think it's a cat. Haley turned the lumpy, roughly furred object he held. Or maybe a ferret? He poked at whatever it was. Might be an animatronic. He put it down and shined his light over the other shapes along the counter. Yeah, awesome, they're prizes, see? Haley scanned his light over the stiff figures. That explained the cave-like cubby holes that lined the broad hallway Greg and his friends had come through to get to the dining area. The little enclosures must have been for arcade cabinets and game booths. I can't believe these are still here. Hades said. Yeah, Greg frowned, studying what looked like a stiffened sea otter and a tangled octopus. Why were they still here? The old pizzeria had stood, boarded up and bombarded by coastal storms and sea air for who knew how long. The structure was clearly abandoned and it looked not just old but ancient on the verge of collapse. The greying weathered siding was so Faded, you could barely tell what it was. The name of the pizzeria was long gone, so why did it look so good on the inside? Well, not good exactly, but from where Greg stood, the building looked sturdy enough to stand another hundred years. Greg and his parents had moved to the small town when he was first when he was in first grade, so he knew the place well, but he didn't really understand it. For example, he always thought it was strange that a boarded up pizzeria had been left untouched in what was supposed to be a vacation spot. But then again, this wasn't exactly a swanky resort town. Greg's mum called it a hodgepodge. Big fancy homes could be found across the street from tiny ugly beach cabins, draped in dirty fishing floats and surrounded by piles of old lumber or crumpled lawn furniture. The house across from Greg's had a huge boxy sedan, like from the 70s, up on, the, up on blocks in the front yard. Still, Greg wondered how, why a pizza place couldn't be turned into something useful instead of being left a gnarled old ghost building that practically screamed break in to local kids. But weirdly, it didn't look like anyone had broken in before Greg and Cyril and Haiti did. Greg had figured they'd find footprints. Trash, graffiti, evidence that other explorers had been here before them. But nothing. It was like the place was abandoned, dipped in formaldehyde, and pres preserved until Greg suddenly felt like he was supposed to come here. I bet these are still here because they're the really good prizes, Haley said. No one ever wins the good prizes, Cyril piped up. He had edged a little closer to the counter, but he was still several feet away. There aren't any clowns, Cyril. Greg had to assure Cyril that there, that there wouldn't be any clowns in the abandoned restaurant in order to convince Cyril to come along. Not that Greg knew one way or the other. What's that one? Cyril pointed at a large-headed figure with a big nose. It sat under a sign that read, Top Prize. Greg picked it up before Haley could. It was heavy and its fur felt matted and coarse. He was oddly drawn to the animal, whatever it was. He studied the pointed ears, sloped forehead, long snout, and piercing yellow eyes. Then he noticed the blue collar around the animal's neck. Something gleaming dangled from the collar. A dog tag? He lifted it. Fetch. Haley read over the... Uh, eh, Haley read over Greg's shoulder. It's a dog named Fetch. Greg loved dogs for the most part, but he hoped to never see one like this in real life. He held the dog up and turned it this way and that. Even the vicious old dog that lived next door to Greg wasn't this ugly. 
Fetch looked like someone had crossed the big bad wolf with a shark from Jaws. His, surely it was a he, head was a triangle pointy on his top and with a mouth far too wide for comfort at the bottom. Fetch's fur, which looked greyish brown in the splodgy glow of their flashlights, was missing in places, revealing tarnished metal beneath. A couple of wires stuck out of the big ears and a partially exposed cavity in Fetch's belly revealed what looked like a primitive circuit board. Look at this! Cyril was surprisingly now interested in the counter. He picked up a small booklet inside the plastic sheath. I think it's the instructions. Let me see. Greg plucked the booklet from Cyril's grasp. Hey! Cyril sque squeaked. <laughs> Greg ignored his protests. This could be it. Putting Fetch back on the counter, he pulled the booklet from the plastic and scanned through the instructions. Hayley read over his shoulder. Cyril stuck his head between uh, Greg's chest and the booklet, forcing Greg to hold the, uh, the, the booklet further out so they could all read together. Fetch, the instructions explained, was an animatronic dock designed to sync up with your phone and retrieve information and other things for you. That's lit, Haley said. Think it still works? How long has this place been empty? Greg asked. Fetch looks like he's older than my dad, but smartphones haven't been around that long. Hades shrugged. Greg finally did it. Uh, Greg finally did too, and he began poking around Fetch to find the control panel. Hades and Cyril lost interest. It isn't going to work. It's older tech. It won't be compatible with our phones. Cyril said, cringing when the wind surged against the building again. Greg felt a chill slither down his spine. Whether it was related to the wind's eerie onslaught or something else, he wasn't sure. Greg returned his attention to Fetch. He wanted to see if he could get the dog thing to do whatever it was supposed to do. He had a hunch this might be what he'd felt in the field, what had called him here. Cyril's pessimism about Fetch didn't surprise Greg. He wouldn't know an opportunity if it dumped him between the eyes. Hady, on the other hand, was relentlessly positive. He had such a sunny disposition he'd pulled off what Greg thought was nothing less than a magic trick. Hady was accepted by the popular crowd, despite having spent most of his time with Greg and Cyril, two of the nerdiest kids in the school. Maybe it had something to do with his looks. Greg had heard girls talking about Hady. Hady was either fine, hot, cute, sharp, or just mm-hmm, depending on the girl who was talking. Hady wandered away from the counter and Cyril plopped down in a chair at the nearest table. I think we should go, he said. Nah, Hady brushed him off. There's still a lot to check out. Greg ignored them both. He'd picked up Fetch and found a panel under Fetch's belly. Juggling the instructions, Fetch and his flashlight, Greg bit his lip and concentrated on hitting the right buttons in the right sequence. For an instant, the wind and rain let up, leaving the building in a silence that felt almost menacing. Greg glanced up at the ceiling. He noticed a large stain above his head. A water stain? Distracted from his task for a second, he shined his light over the whole ceiling. No other stains. In fact, why wasn't the hole inside of the restaurant dripping? He thought he'd seen part of the metal roof missing when he'd first looked at the building. Why wasn't it leaking? Shrugging, he returned his attention to Fetch. At this point, he was just randomly pushing buttons. None of the sequences laid out in the instructions were doing anything. As abruptly as it had stopped, the wind and rain started up again in a crescendo of ma ma maniacal... Uh, is that how you say it? Maniacal? Maniacal... <laughs> maniacal drumming, pounding and wailing. That's when Fetch moved. Suddenly, with a whirring sound, Fetch's head raised. Then his gaping, tooth-filled mouth opened and he growled. What the hell? Greg dropped Fetch on the counter and leaped back. Simultaneously, Cyril erupted from his chair. What? Haley asked, returning to his friends. Greg pointed at Fetch, whose head and mouth were in clearly different positions than they had been when they found him. Sick, Haley said. They all stared at Fetch, edging backward in unspoken agreement that a little distance was a good idea in case Fetch did something else. They waited, so did Fetch. Haley got bored first. He shined his flashlight in the direction of the stage. What do you think is behind that curtain? I think I don't want to know, Cyril said. Behind them, a door slammed inside the building. As a unit, the boys ran through the dining room and down the hall to the storage room they'd broken into. Even though he was the smallest, Cyril reached the room first. He was out through the narrow gap they'd managed to create in the jammed service door opening before the other boys could, could squeeze through. 
outside, pelted by rain, streaking sideways. They grabbed at their bikes. Greg figured the wind was gusting over 50 miles per hour now. No way could they bike home. He looked at Hady, whose curly black hair was matted against his head. Hady burst out laughing, and Greg joined in. Sewell hesitated, then started laughing too. Come on, Hady shouted over the screaming wind. Without looking back at the restaurant, they put their heads down and pushed their bikes against the storm. As he trudged beside his friends, Greg thought about why he'd wanted them to come to the abandoned restaurant. They'd left so much of it unexplored, like the area behind the curtain. There'd been three closed doors off the hallway too. What was behind them? Greg was afraid he might not have gotten what he was there for. Had he done what he was meant to do? Interesting. <laughs> um, Greg was close to home when a woman called out, Wet enough for you? He stopped, wiped his eyes and squinted through the rain. Hey, Mrs. Peters. He called when he saw his elderly neighbour standing on her covered front porch. She threw up her skinny arms. Love these storms, she sang out. He laughed and waved at her. Enjoy, he shouted. She waved too and he plodded on. When he neared his parents' tall, modern oceanfront house, Greg was surprised to see a light in the living room window. The town was still dark. When he'd parted with Cyril and Hady, the only lights he'd seen were their flashlights bobbing along like disembodied spirits, and the flickers of what looked like candles inside a couple houses. The light in his window, however, was bright and steady. When he pulled his bike in next to the stilts that raised the house a full story off the ground, he discovered why he'd seen light. At first drowned out by the thunderous sounds of the wind and rain, he hadn't heard the motor until he practically walked into it. A shiny new generator sat under the house, chugging away, a cord extending past the two-car garage and up the stairs to the front door. Greg peeled off his dripping rain jacket as he climbed the steps, but before he reached the front door, it opened. There you are, boyo! Greg's uncle Darren grinned down at him, his mountainous six foot five broad shouldered frame filling the doorway. I was about to mount a search pose. I don't know what that is. Posts. <laughs> you didn't answer your phone. Greg reached the entry and exchanged his and his uncle's signature greeting a half hug double fist bump. Sorry, Dad, I didn't hear it. He pulled the phone from his pocket and tapped it. Dare had texted and called him multiple times. Wow, I swear I didn't hear it. Who could hear anything in this wind? Get inside. Where'd the generator come from? Greg asked. He didn't really care. He was trying to distract himself from thinking about why he didn't hear his phone in the restaurant. It hadn't been that loud outside. Could it have been because... I got it in Olympia. Your dad's been saying for years you don't need it, but that's belonky. I told him he's going to wish he had one. They'd been staying they'd been saying the storms will be much worse this winter, and wouldn't you know it, they came early this year. How about that rain we got last week for Halloween? Dad shook his head. Of course, your dad won't listen. Greg didn't remember that argument, but then Dare and Greg's dad had so many arguments. How could he remember any specific one? Uncle Darren was Greg's mother's brother, her only sibling, and they were close. Greg and Dare were even closer. But Greg's dad hated Dare for the, re the, for the very reasons Greg loved him. Because Dare was flamboyant and fun. Dare needs to grow up, Greg's dad would say over and over. With long hair dyed purple and worn in a braid and a, and a wardrobe of bright... Oh my god, I'm tripping over my words. And a wardrobe of bright coloured suits and ties paired with painfully patterned shirts, Dare had his own distinct look. That Dare was also a wealthy, successful inventor of car parts and had the most amazing luck with investments and money in general was the nail in his coffin as far as Greg's dad was concerned. People like him don't deserve success, he often groused. Greg's dad was a contractor and he worked more than he wanted to afford their big house and the expensive cars he liked. The fact that Dare lived on a 10 acre estate and made tons of money from tinkering in his workshop was too much. Greg loved Dare the way he wished he could love his dad. Dare had done nothing but accept Greg from the day he squi his squished little head entered the world, despite the fact that Greg was never a cute baby and he hadn't turned into a cute kid. His face was too long, his eyes were too close together and his nose was too small. He compensated for all of that with long, wavy blonde hair, a great smile, or so a girl in his former 8th gra grade class had said, 
and enough height and muscle to think he might not be a total lost cause after high school. Never drawn to typical boy things like cars and sports, no matter how hard his, di his dad tried to force them down his throat, Greg found an ally in there, uh, an, al an ally in there, who didn't question Greg's likes or dislikes. He accepted Greg as he was. Where's mom? Greg asked there. Book club. Greg didn't ask about his dad. One, he didn't care. Two, he knew his dad would be playing poker with his buddies. That was how he spent his Saturday evenings, even if he had to play cards by candlelight. Where were, where were you boys in this weather? There asked. Um, can I keep that a secret? Dev tilted his huge head and stroked his grey and goatee. Sure, I trust you. Thanks. You want to play backgammon? Dare asked. Can I take a rain check? Ha! Good one. Dare gestured to Greg's still dripping coat. Greg shook his head. Unintentional. Um, I just wanted to do some reading. Sure, no prob. I just came by to set up the generator for you guys. When you weren't here and I couldn't get a hold of you, I figured I'd stay until Worry fried my circuits and made my and made me phone the police. Greg grinned. I'm glad I made it home before you called the cops. Me too. Dare started to reach for his magenta raincoat, then hesitated and snapped his fingers. Oh, by the way, I heard you got your first babysitting gig. Glad you finally brought your old man around. It was really thanks to you. Once you threw your two cents in, it was three against one. I'm sitting for the McNally's kid next week. Jake? They need someone to watch him on Saturdays. No way. His mum and I go back, go way back. Maybe I'll stop by sometime, bring you guys a treat. Or bring my... Uh, bring by my new puppy. I've been thinking seriously about getting a dog. Really? Cool. Yeah. A friend has a Shih Tzu that's going to have puppies soon. I, I'm thinking I've been without a dog long enough. I miss having a dog to cuddle with. Greg laughed. Just be sure it's a nice Shih Tzu. I think the beast next door is part Shih Tzu. Um, that snaggletooth mongrel. Nah, no dog of mine will be like that. Remember, Dare said holding up his right index finger, on which he wore his favourite onyx and gold ring. I have the magic finger of luck, Dare and Greg said in unison. They laughed. The magic finger of luck had been an ongoing joke since Greg was about four years old. One day, Greg was crying because he wanted the stuffed octopus in a claw machine. He hadn't been able to get it when his mother put money in the machine, and he tried with a claw. Dare had tapped the glass of the claw machine with his right index finger and had said in a deep voice, I have the magic finger of luck. I will get you the octopus. And he had done it on the first try. After that, Dare called on the magic finger of luck to get things to go his way. It pretty much, was, it pretty much always worked. Greg stopped laughing, thinking again about the neighbour's dog. Yeah, I still can't believe that thing bit me. The neighbours next door had moved in the year before, and two days later their dog, a small but evil mutt with very sharp teeth and one missing eye, charged out at Greg and bit him on the ankle. He had to have ten stitches. Okay, I'll go and leave you to your reading, Dare said. Before I go though, let's make sure everything's working right. Fifteen minutes later, Greg was lounging on his double bed reading by the nice bright light of his red pendant reading lamp. Dare had gotten the family a power transfer system for the generator that hooked up to the breaker box. With the flip of a few switches, power was restored to the whole house. Got this especially for your gaming needs, Dare said before giving Greg another half hug, double fist bump and leaving. Even though he really wanted to get to his reading, Greg took the time to do his nightly yoga rout routine before sliding under the oversized Afghan... Uh, Dare had knitted for him. Dare had also taught him yoga and Greg loved it. It not only calmed him down before bed, it helped him stay in shape. Not that good shape was good enough. Uh, Greg stood in front of the mirror and examined his narrow shoulders and slight chest. Even though he had muscles in his arms and legs, his torso was still too thin. And his face? Greg's phone buzzed. He picked it up and looked at a text from Hadi. You recovered? Greg snorted, he, as if he was scared enough to need recovering. From what? He texted back, playing dumb. You can't fool me. Okay, Greg responded. Yeah, I'm good. 
need more courage, I guess. You need Brian Reinhardt's brain. He's not afraid of anything. Greg laughed. Good point. Brian Reinhardt was the football team's star running back. He texted, I could use his legs too. Uh, fast for running away. Lol. <laughs> How about Steve Thornton's shoulders, powerful enough to dump scary things? Greg laughed again, but Hady was onto something. If Greg was going to do what he'd set out to do, why didn't he pick and choose what he wanted? Okay, he typed in, but I want Don Waring's chest too then. Greg grinned at the idea of constructing a body from football players' parts. He needed a good face though, especially if he was going to get a girl to pay attention to him. I want Ron Fisher's eyes, he texted. RGR. I don't know what that means. RGR. Am I just too much of a boomer to know what RGR means? How about uh, Neil Manning's nose? Greg smiled and typed ob. I guess obviously. Mouth. Uh, Greg thought about it. He responded, Zach's BFG. Greg smiled. He could picture Hades' big frickin' grin. Hair. I like my own, Greg replied. Ego much? Greg laughed. GG. Greg typed in, BFN. Greg flopped onto his bed. <laughs> All of this means nothing to me. <laughs> what zoomers they are. Uh, Greg flopped onto his bed. He picked up his journal and the book on the zero point field he needed to check. This is more my kind of stuff. He glanced over at his plants before he started reading. They were the key to this, weren't they? They made the exchange he just had with Haiti more than just a silly game. Well, they were at least the catalyst. Learning about Cleve Baxter's experiments is what had launched him down the road he was on. But the plants wouldn't help him tonight. He needed to review what he knew about random event generators or REGs. He flipped through his book. Yes, there it was, Machines and Consciousness. Cause and effect. He put the book down and skimmed his last journal entry. He hadn't misinterpreted what he'd gotten, had he? No, he didn't think so. He was either on the right track or he wasn't. And if he wasn't, he didn't think he wanted to know what track he was on. The way he'd been drawn to that place couldn't have been a coincidence. The storm hung around another day, but it fizzled out late su Sunday night. Power came back on. School was in session as usual Monday morning. Uh, Greg endured the first half of the day and was relieved when 1.10pm finally rolled around and he got to Advanced Scientific Theory. Advanced Scientific Theory was an AP class reserved for freshmen who had won science fair prizes in the previous two years. The class had only 12 students. It was taught by a visiting teacher, Mr. Je Jacoby, or Jacoby, I'm going to say Jacoby, who also taught at Grays Harbour Community College. Grays Harbour, huh? Oh, I don't know. Is Grays Harbour... Where is Grays Harbour? I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, this is good for geography of like Phasma Frights though. Uh, as always, Greg was always the first one in the classroom. He sat in the front. Only Haley would sit near him. Mr. Jacoby was pra practically bouncing at the front of the yellow walled classroom when the bell rang. Tall and lanky but so full of energy, he reminded Greg of a long coiled spring. Mr. Jacoby was an enthusiastic teacher who was undaunted by disinterested students. Greg loved science, all science, not just tech, and his passion had earned him the title of teacher's pet. Mr. Jacoby always lectured while darting around the front of the classroom like he had bugs in his pants. Sometimes he scribbled on the whiteboard, more often he just rambled. But it was interesting stuff. This small room, filled with tall wooden lab tables and counter-height chairs, was one of Greg's favourite places in the school. He loved the periodic table and the constellation posters on the walls. He loved the smell of the fertiliser that fed the hybrid plants growing at the back of the room. It made him think of science and learning. Running a hand through unruly red hair, Mr. Jacoby began, In quantum physics, there is something known as the zero-point field. This field is scientific proof that there is no such thing as a vacuum, no such thing as nothingness. If you empty all space of matter and energy, you still find, in subatomic terms, a bunch of activity. This constant activity is a field of energy that is always in motion, subatomic matter constantly interacting with each other. Uh, with, yeah, with each other. Uh, Mr. Jacoby rubbed a freckled nose. Are you all with me? I am. <laughs> I remember learning about this sort of thing. I love it. Uh... Greg nodded enthusiastically. Hady, who sat next to him at the three-person lab table, nudged him. Hey, this is your shtick. 
Greg ignored him. Mr. Jacoby grinned at Greg and took his nod to represent the entire class, which was unwise, but Greg was fine with it. Good, Mr. Jacoby con continued. So this energy is called the zero point field because fluctuations in the field are still found in temperatures of absolute zero. Absolute zero is the lowest possible energy state where everything's been removed and there should be ze no, there, there, there should be nothing remaining to make any motion. Make sense? Yeah, uh, zero Kelvin. <laughs> um, Greg nodded again. Great, so the energy should be zero, but when they measure the energy mathematically, it never actually reaches zero. There's always some remaining vibration due to continued particle exchange. Still with me? Yeah, it, there's an asymptote at, at zero, which means it can never get to zero. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop. Uh, I'm such a nerd. Greg nodded enthusiastically. He'd had no idea Mr. Jacoby was going to talk about this today. What were the odds? He grinned. There were no odds. It was the field. He was so excited that he missed the next few minutes of Mr. Jacoby's lecture. It didn't matter, he knew this stuff. He did tune back in though, when Kimberly Bergstrom uh, raised her hand. Well, he sort of tuned back in. He heard a question. Is this just a theory? He also heard the start of Mr. Jacoby's answer. Not entirely. Consider this scientific trend before the scientific revolution. That's where Greg tuned out again. He got caught up in watching Kimberly. Who wouldn't? Long inky black hair, amazing green eyes, prettier than any model Greg had ever seen. Greg felt himself flush, and he whipped his gaze away from Kimberly before someone caught him staring. Too late. Haley nudged him again, and when Greg looked over, Haley made goofy goo-goo eyes at him. Greg shifted his attention back to Mr. Jacoby. As usual, Greg was the last one out of the room when class was over. Mr. Jacoby smiled at him as Greg gathered his stuff, and Greg gave another thought to talking to his teacher. Then he felt his phone vibrate. Waving at Mr. Jacoby, Greg pulled out his phone as he stepped into the hallway. He looked at the screen. Hello, Greg. Hey, Charlie. you? How are you? Uh, the phone number wasn't familiar. Greg looked around. Who was texting him? He entered, I'm fine. Who's this? Then he watched his screen. Fetch. Oh, very funny, Haley. Greg muttered. He texted what he said. The reply wasn't what he had expected. Question mark for you? What's your question? Uh, <laughs> Greg texted. Why do you leave? Greg rolled his eyes and entered. You're hilarious. T.Y. You answer. Greg felt a tap on the shoulder. You're going to be a. You're going to be late for Spanish, amigo. <laughs> Haley said. Greg whipped around, Haley raised an eyebrow, and Cyril, who stood next to him, took a stuttered step back. Why are you texting me if you're right here? Greg asked Haley. Dude, you whacked? Do I look like you're do I look like I'm texting you? Uh actually no. Haley's phone was nowhere in sight. Greg looked back at his phone. Whoever was texting him had repeated, You answer. Uh Greg looked at Cyril. Did you text me? No. Por qué habría? <laughs> Poké <laughs> here, Abdia. Uh, I don't know why you'd text me and stop speaking in Spanish, Greg said. Uh, Cyril ignored him. Venga. He tugged on Greg's sleeve. I hate Spanish, Greg said. Cyril looked past Greg and said, Hola, Manuel. <laughs> I don't know Spanish, okay, so I'm trying my best. Greg turned to look at Manuel Gomez, who had transferred into the school a couple weeks before from Madrid, Spain. Hola, Cyril. ¿Cómo estás? Estoy bien. Tú? Bueno. Oi, Manuel, conozques a Greg? <laughs> this is so much fun. Cyril asked, gesturing at Greg. No. Manuel smiled at Greg and held out his hand. Encantada de consorte. Conocerte. He just said, nice to meet you. Gre Cyril told Greg. Lo sé, Greg said. I'm not a total Spanish spaz. Close enough. Cyril said. Manuel laughed. Greg tiene muchos problemas con el, con el español. I was doing so well. Oh my gosh. Greg tiene muchos problemas con el español. <laughs> I'll take it. Cyril told Manuel. I'd be happy to help you with Spanish anytime. Manuel said to Greg. Want me to give you my number? He held up his phone. Sure. Greg swapped phones with Manuel and they exchanged numbers. Yo, Mousy, someone called out to Cyril. How's your mum doing? She's still a freak like you. 
Greg turned and faced Cyril's bully. He cleared his throat and said loudly, Remember this, Trent. Three things in life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind, so said Henry James. Trent shoved Greg. You're a freak. As Trent sauntered away, Haley nudged Greg. You read too much. You don't read enough. In unison, they said in, exas in exaggerated deep voices, The universe is in balance. They bumped fists and finished with cha. A couple of kids in the hall deliberately jostled Greg and one of them said, You guys are weird. I'm proud of it, Greg sang. Haley shook his head. Manuel touched Greg's shoulder. I like Henry James too. He grinned and held out a fist. Greg bumped fist with Manuel. Then, shoving his phone in his pocket, Greg followed Cyril and Haley to Spanish. He wasn't going to talk to them about the text now, but he didn't stop thinking about the texts either. If neither Haley nor Cyril sent them, who did? Was someone else in the restaurant with the boys on Saturday night? Is this what that slamming door was? Or did someone see them leave, then go in, and then find Fetch? The idea that they'd been watched made Greg's, screen, uh, made Greg's skin cruel, but the idea that they hadn't been watched made all their hairs stand up on Greg's arms. Could it be? He wouldn't think about it. Not yet. By the next day, he was thinking about it hard. In that time, he'd received a dozen texts from Fetch. Now, by, by now, he realised the text had to be from the animatronic. They couldn't be from anyone else, because no one else could know anything, everything Fetch was texting about. Obviously, Fetch was dialed into Greg, so to speak. It quickly became clear that Fetch was synced with Greg's phone, and he was trying to live up to his name. When Greg told Cyril he needed more time to do homework, Fetch sent Greg a link to a time management article, and a clock app appeared on Greg's phone. When Greg looked up REGs online, he received a link from Fetch to an article about the latest research into intention and REGs. When Greg finished the article, te uh, Fetch texted 01010111 Oh. This baffled Greg until he thought about the article he just read. The article talked about the experiments being done that used REGs to measure whether a person could think hard enough to have an effect on an outcome in the physical world. Greg knew REGs ran, uh, generated random ones and zeros. Ones and zeros, Greg thought. Was it possible? Greg copied Fetch's text into a binary to text converter and sure enough, Fetch had, te Fetch had texted OK in binary code. Ah, so Fetch is, a, is an REG, I assume. Greg shivered as he texted back, OK. He wasn't sure it was OK at all. It was more spooky than OK. Then things got stranger, as if getting texts from an old animatronic dog wasn't bizarre enough to begin with. One day, Greg told his mum on the phone that he was craving chocolate. She said what she always said when he mentioned candy. Not good for you. Have an apple. Later that day, when she got home from shopping, she pulled a chocolate bar out of the bag. How did this get here? She said in annoyance, tucking her chin-length blonde hair behind an ear. I didn't buy this. She checked her receipt and discovered the bar on, was on the order she'd placed online. Must be a glitch, she said. I'll have to email them. When she caught Greg watching her, she said, well, it's your lucky day, and tossed him the bar. As he caught the candy bar, he was pretty sure he couldn't eat it yet. He was too excited. If he was right, Fetch had just fetched him a candy bar. What else could the animatronic dog do? And how was he doing it? Greg could accept, barely, that Fetch was synced with his phone. But Fetch wasn't synced with his mom's phone, was he? The text messages continued day after day. Sometimes Greg responded, just because. Sometimes not. Either way, he kept a log in his journal. This was giving him important feedback for his project. A lot of his exchanges with Fetch made no sense, like the day Fetch texted DDAS. Why would I do anything stupid? Greg responded, dunno. I don't know what, the, what this means. <laughs> Maybe I'm just like so oblivious to it. Uh, sometimes the texts were clear. One day, Greg texted Cyril that he was having trouble with the Spanish homework and needed the translation for, I don't know how to make banana bread without eggs or flour. Cyril didn't respond. But Fetch texted, 
No sé cómo hacer pan de platano sin huevos ni harina. No sé cómo hacer pan de platano sin habanos en ti. I can't do that. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I know Italian and uh, and French, but I don't know Spanish. Cyril didn't text back until late in the evening. When he did, his translation was the same as Fetch's. Was it time for Greg to tell his friends what was going on? He decided to wait. But then came the spider. One Saturday, a couple of weeks before Christmas, Greg was taking care of Jake, his now usual Saturday babysitting gig. Dare, or Uncle Dare, to both Greg and Jake, thanks to Dare's close relationship with Mrs. McNally, had suggested he'd come over with a rainy day picnic, complete with a yellow smiley face picnic blanket, some, plotted, uh, some potted plants, uh, rubber toy insects, and a wicker basket full of creative sandwiches like artichoke salad with provolone and raisins on pumpernickel and chicken and peanut butter on rye. I have no idea what any of that meant. Fortunately, Dare knew Greg wasn't as adventurous with food as he was, so he included a couple of ordinary tuna salad sandwiches too. They set up their picnic in the living room, in front of the big picture window overlooking the dunes and the ocean. You could barely see the ocean through the rain, one shade of grey merged with the next. Jake, four years old, loved the picnic, but he wasn't keen on the huge rubber spider that lurked near the edge of the picnic blanket. He was so agitated that Greg suggested that they pull that they put the picnic on hold. He got out two spatulas and made a big production of scooping up the spider and putting it in a sealed plastic bag. That wasn't enough for Jake. Out, he demanded, pointing a chubby finger toward the door. So Greg put on his rain jacket and went out in the rain. While Dare and Jake supervised from under the shelter of the house, Greg dug a hole in the mud and buried the rubber spider. Satisfied, Jake ate the rest of his picnic lunch without comment. Good job, boyo, Dare said. Greg enjoyed the praise. He, ne he sure never got any from his dad, who, as usual, was working. When Dare was around, though, he didn't seem to mind his father's disapproval as much. His uncle made everything seem better. A couple days before Christmas, Greg and Haley were talking on the phone about Trent. He's such a jerk, Greg said. He laid on his bed watching his plants, sending specific thoughts to them like one might send to an REG. Just like in Cleve Baxter's experiments, his plants seemed to be responding well to his latest intentions. I don't really pl uh, pay attention to him, Haley said, but I know he freaks out Cyril. Yeah, he needs to be pranked, Haley said. I was thinking spiders. I overheard him the other day telling Zack he's afraid of spiders. Greg laughed. Seriously? I've got a rubber one buried in my backyard. Maybe if the rain stops, I'll dig it up before I come over. Yeah, do that. <laughs> it would make a nice surprise in his stocking. Greg waited a few hours, but the rain didn't let up. It thrummed relentlessly on the roof. If Greg hadn't promised Haley he'd go over to wrap presents, he wouldn't have left the house. But he promised, so he geared up for the rain and stepped outside. He almost uh, screamed when he looked down and saw a huge spider covering the well of welcome friends on his mother's jute doormat. Jumping back, he stared at the spider, realising now what it was. Greg felt his pulse accelerate. This was not possible. But there it was. It was the rubber spider he'd buried, still in its now muddy plastic bag. No one except Dare and Jake knew where that spider was. Jake and his family had gone to Hawaii for Christmas, and Dare was on a ski trip with friends. Wish you could be here for our white Christmas, boyo. Dare had said on the phone the night before. Leaning over and picking up the plastic bag by the corner, as if it was a deadly creature in and, in and, out, eh, in and of itself, Greg held the bag in front of his face. Were those teeth marks along the bottom edge? He dropped the bag. His phone buzzed. He sucked in his breath and fumbled for his phone. Merry Xmas. Merry Christmas to you, Fetch. Greg entered while trying to ignore the fact that his fingers were trembling. He didn't wait for a reply. Ignoring the urge to throw the phone into the shrubs at the edge of his yard, he shoved it back in his pocket. It was time. He had to talk to his friends. The day after Christmas, the boys gathered in Greg's room on the bed. 
Greg sat with his back against the navy blue cushioned headboard, his friends sprawled next to each other at the foot. He glanced around the room, taking comfort in his familiar surroundings. Posters of movie musicals alternated with puppy posters on the walls, and two shelving units stuffed with books flanked the window that looked out toward the ocean. The sky outside was matte grey, as if an artist with no sense of depth had just slathered paint across the horizon. On the wall opposite the window, his plants sat in rows of shelving under a low-hanging bank of grow lights. His antique roll-top desk, a gift from Dare, sat next to the door. A plate of gingerbread cookies Greg had baked two days before sat in the middle of the bed. Grabbing a cookie, Haley asked, What's this urgent meeting about? Yeah, Sewer squeaked. I was going to go to the day after Christmas sales with my mom. Haley shook his head. Seriously, dude, do you listen to yourself? You might as well wear a t-shirt that says, make fun of me. Greg threw a dirty sock at Haley. Leave him alone. If he likes to shop with his mom, he likes to shop with his mom. Haley gave Greg a mock bow. You make a point, he nodded towards Cyril, this time for real. Sorry. It's okay. In the silence that followed, Greg weighed how he was going to explain everything. Well, maybe he wasn't going to explain everything. Maybe just some things. For sure he had to tell them about Fetch. He looked over to his nightstand, which held stacks of books, papers, and his phone, still receiving texts from Fetch. His most recent, an hour before Cyril and Haley showed up, was, Do you need food for meeting? No thank you, Greg texted back. He took a deep breath and wrinkled his nose at the scent of the lavender air freshener his mother had put some place in his room. He'd been looking for it, but hadn't found it yet. He preferred the smell of his sweaty clothes, thank you very much. Okay, so there's no way to say this, but to say it, he began. Hady and Cyril looked at him. Fetch has been sending me texts. His friends stared at him. They blinked in unison. Who's Fetch? Hady asked. Wait, you mean that dog thing? That prize from the pizzeria? Is this a joke? Cyril asked. Greg shook his head. He picked up one of the stacks of papers from his nightstand. All the text messages he'd printed out and held it. Uh, out to Cyril. Look, he waited while Cyril and Haley scooted together so they could read the text at the same time. This can't be real, Cyril said. His voice was even higher than normal. Haley grabbed the stack of printouts and flipped through them. He glanced at Greg, then said to Cyril, He wouldn't prank us like that. No, I wouldn't, Greg said. Want to see my phone? I'm smart, but I'm not smart enough to spoof texts on my phone. Haley shook his head. He abruptly stood and started pacing in a tiny circle on Greg's blue and maroon braided rug. It must have synced with your phone, dude, Haley said finally. Greg nodded. Yeah, except... Whoa, wait, Cyril said. I'm not a techie, but I don't see how something as old as that animatronic dog could sync up with a modern smartphone. That's just not possible. Obviously it is, though, Haley said. It's not just syncing. Greg reached for the muddy plastic bag containing the spider and held it up. He felt like he should say, Exhibit A, but didn't. What's that? Cyril shifted away so fast he fell off the bed with a thud. Greg suppressed a laugh while Cyril jumped up. Sorry, Greg said. It's not real. He told them the story of the picnic and then the appearance of the unearthed bag on his doorstep. Cyril gaped at him, then looked from Haley to Greg and back to Haley. No way. Let me see that. Haley snatched the bag from Greg's grasp and examined it. Those are teeth marks. No way, Cyril repeated. Way, Haley said. It's like my plants, I think, Greg began. It was time to share what he was sure was behind all of this. Haley and Cyril stared at him. What? Haley asked. Have you heard of Cleve Baxter? Greg asked. Pretty sure they hadn't. They shook their heads. He was a, poly, uh, sorry, a polygraph expert who started doing experiments with plants in the 1960s. Okay, Haley said. So what? So in the 1960s, Baxter had the idea to hook up a plant to a polygraph machine to see if he could measure how long osmosis took. Although he didn't learn a thing about osmosis, he stumbled upon something else. Something super cool, Greg stopped. Cyril and Haley were still staring at the spider in the bag. They probably weren't even listening to him, and even if they were, Greg realised there was no way he was ready to tell them his theory. 
What if someone was in the building with us and now they're watching you? Cyril asked, confirming that he and Haley hadn't been listening. What, like a stalker? Haley asked. And he bugged my phone or something? Greg asked. That's just crazy. But wasn't any crazier than what he thought was going on? Greg's phone buzzed. He picked it up and read the incoming text. He dropped the phone on the bed. Haley and Cyril looked from the phone to Greg. He pointed at it. When they leaned over to look at it, he looked too and read the text again. E-L. What's E-L? Cyril asked. Haley went pale. He met Greg's wide-eyed gaze. Evil laugh, they said in unison. An animatronic dog that wanted to be helpful was one thing. An animatronic dog that wanted to be helpful and had a sense of humour was okay. But an animatronic dog who had an agenda, well, that was scary. After that, Greg stopped trying to get Haley and Cyril to understand what he thought was going on with Fetch. So, when they finished freaking out about Fetch's text, he told them he'd keep them posted and decided it was time to conduct more experiments. Going to the abandoned restaurant in itself had been a test, and he still wasn't sure how that had turned out. It had started with him putting an, an intention out, a desire backed by his will, that it, that it unfold. That had led to an impulse to act. The impulse had taken him to the restaurant, where he found Fetch. But how did Fetch play into the grand scheme of things? He had to figure it out. He decided to start with something small and specific. The next day, he got his first experiment's result. In advanced scientific theory, Mr. Jacoby, looking even more nerdy than usual in a blue checkered short-sleeved shirt under a red and blue argyle uh, sweater vest, started his lecture with, So now that we understand the zero-point field, let's see if we can figure out what it means for the real world. To this end, we're going to talk about REGs. Awesome, Greg thought. A random event generator, usually referred to as an REG, Mr. Jacoby said, is a machine that basically flips a coin. Not really, of course, but it's a machine that's designed to generate a random output, just the same as you'd get by flipping a coin, assuming you're not cheating at it. Mr. Jacoby grinned, then continued. Instead of heads or tails, REGs produce a positive or negative pulse and then turn the pulses into ones and zeros, which as you know, is binary code, the language of computers. Once the pulses are in binary code, they can be stored and counted. Researchers built the REGs as a way of studying the impact that focused thought, that focused thought has on events. Make sense? Greg nodded, and he noticed Kimberly did as well. Excellent. Mr. Jacoby clapped his hands once. So, I was able to get a small REG, and now it's time to do some intention experiments with it. I'm assigning partners. Greg held his breath. Will it work? He only had to wait through two pairings to find out. Greg and Kimberly, Mr. Jacoby said. Pair up. Kimberly turned gracefully in her chair, her hair sweeping through the air like she was in a shampoo commercial. She smiled at Greg, and his bones nearly disintegrated. He had to clutch the lab table to stay in his seat. His intention had worked. Grinning back at Kimberly and waving at her so exuberantly that her own smile faltered a little, Greg forced himself to stay seated. He had enough wits about him to know that if he did a happy dance, he'd be laughed at for years. Mr. Jacoby made everyone move around so partners were seated together. He instructed them to exchange phone numbers because they need to stay in contact. Greg had to concentrate to keep his hand steady when he passed his phone to Kimberly and took her phone, tucked into a bright purple case to enter his number. After they returned each other's phones and Mr. Jacoby started explaining the experiment's instructions, Greg's phone buzzed, and per class rules, he ignored it. It wasn't until he was out in the hall, after he and Kimberly set a time to meet to do the first step of the experiment, that he checked his phone. Fetch had text. Congrats. At the end of the day, Greg couldn't wait to get home to record the triumph in his journal. Unfortunately, he'd missed the bus that morning, and he'd had to bike to school. That wasn't a problem, but now the wind was blowing from the southeast, and he couldn't bike hard enough to overcome the gusts trying to shove him back toward the school. Eventually, he gave up and walked his bike the rest of the way to his house. He was so lost in thought, he forgot about the tiny terror that lived next door. It was like a rabid, furry missile was careening toward him at top speed. 
He nearly jumped to Mars when the dog launched itself from an outdoor table and threw itself over the fence right at him. Crap! He let go of his bike and dropped his backpack, catching the dog just as it hit his chest and started snapping at his jugular. What was it with, these, with this dog? On reflex, he pushed the dog back over the short fence. When the dog hit the ground, it came up barking and snarling and it flung itself against the wooden boards. Greg didn't wait to see what it would do next. He grabbed his bike and backpack and ran for his house. Once inside, he realised he was hyperventilating. Sinking to the floor in the puddle, created by his dripping coat, he texted Haley, Devil dog just tried to slash my throat. Scared the hell out of me. You okay? Haley responded. Shaken, not stirred. Haley texted back. Lol. That night, Greg had nightmares. Not a surprise. He spent the whole night in the abandoned pizzeria being chased alternately by Fetch, a faceless man, and the dog next door, while plants grew so fast inside the restaurant that the place turned into a jungle. On the stage, an REG spewed out what, uh, zeros and ones, almost too fast for the eye to register. Greg woke up covered in sweat. Did the dream mean it was working or not? Shaking off the bad night, Greg scowled out the window at the sideways rain. More wind? Apparently Dare was right about this year's winter storms. He threw on some clothes quickly, already late for school. Racing to the door, Greg waved at his mum, who was on the phone. He ignored his dad, who was scowling at a, at a spreadsheet on his laptop while he guzzled coffee. Greg threw on his rain jacket, grabbed his backpack, and went out the door and down the steps. That's where he came to a stop. So abrupt, he lost his balance and had to grab the stair railing. His eyes widened, his pulse rate flew into overdrive, and his stomach clenched. This couldn't be happening. Turning away from what was in front of him, Greg staggered to the nearest bush and threw up. All he had in his stomach was water, which came up, along with yellow bile. Then, even though his stomach was empty, it lurched some more and he endured a couple rounds of dry heaves. Finally, he collapsed onto the bottom step of the stairs and wiped his mouth. His fingers were stiff and cold. He took several deep breaths, cringing at the sour smell of his vomit and the stench coming from next to his bike. Greg stood. He didn't want to stand, and his legs felt so weak it was clear they weren't on board with the idea either, but he had to do something before his parents came out. Looking around wildly, as if someone might appear to help him, which actually was the last thing he wanted, he tried to figure out what to do. Well, he knew what he had to do. He had to move it, which meant he had to touch it. No way was he going to touch it. He smacked himself on the forehead. Think, dummy! The admonition worked. He dug his keys out of his pocket and strode to the garden shed tucked against the back of his house. Dropping his keys twice before he could get the right one on the lock, he was drenched by the time he stepped inside the shed and retrieved the black plastic garbage bag he was after. Now that he was in action, he moved at hyper speed. He slammed and locked the shed door, not worrying about the sound because the wind and rain drowned out everything. He raced back to his bike. And once again, he had to confront what he didn't want to look at. This time, he made himself look, really look. The neighbor's dog lay, dead, against the back wheel of Greg's bike tire, its throat torn apart, its belly gutted, intestines flopping onto the concrete. It was stiff, and its eyes were wide open, as if staring in fear, maybe for the first and last time of its life. Greg forced himself to examine the dog's fatal wounds. Yeah, it's just what his subconscious mind told him in the first glance. The dog hadn't been killed with a knife or some other sharp object. It had been ferociously ripped by teeth and claws. It had been attacked by another animal. Greg gagged and swallowed down another dry heave. Breathing through his mouth, he opened the plastic bag and put it down over the dog. Once he had it covered, he slipped the bag under the animal and used the plastic to scoop up the entrails. When he had it all, he carried the bag to the bushes between his and his neighbour's house and emptied it into the bushes. The dog fell with a sickening splat onto the ground. Greg looked up at his house to be sure neither of his parents were looking out the window. Nope, all good. The neighbour's house was one story. They couldn't see into his yard, and this part of the yard was sheltered from the street. No one was watching him. Even so, this probably wasn't the best plan in the world. 
but it was the best he had. If the dog was a human, forensics would point to Greg in a nanosecond, but the corpse was a dog. He didn't figure there'd be much of an investigation when the body was found. It looked like the nasty little thing had been mauled by a coyote. But it hadn't been. As much as he'd loved to convince himself that that's what happened, Greg knew no coyote would, uh, would kill a dog and then pose it next to Greg's bike. Because the dog had clearly been posed. Although a little blood from the dog's neck and intestines strained the concrete next to Greg's tyre, it wasn't nearly enough blood for, savage, for the savagery of the dog's wounds. The dog must have been killed someplace else. No, coyotes had nothing to do with the dog's death. Greg realised he was frozen in place by the bush. He wadded up the plastic bag, trotted to the trash bin under his house, and stuffed it inside one of the bags of kitchen trash. He closed the lid. That's when his phone buzzed. He didn't want to look at it, but he had to. The incoming text was, as Greg knew it would be, from Fetch. Y. W. Greg was still staring at the screen when another text came in. This one from Hady. W. R. U. He should have been at Hady's house to catch the bus there five minutes ago. He quickly texted, sorry, late. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming this means you're welcome. This means where are you? If you don't, if you don't know text talk, that they use text talk like a lot. I don't understand why people do that because it's really confusing. <laughs> like, who uses W R U instead of where are you? It's it's literally easier to communicate with the words where are you. But anyway, and and like eight instead of an A T E. It's like weird. Uh, then he grabbed his bike and pedaled out into the rain, hoping that the wind at his back would help him get to Hades before the bus arrived. Greg spent the day paying very little attention to what was going on around him. Every chance he got, he pulled out his phone and scrolled back to delete old text messages. The spider had spooked him, but the dead dog had terrified him. Fetch had killed the dog to help Greg. What other help would Fetch try to offer? It didn't take long after finding the dog for Greg to conclude that Fetch could do all kinds of nasty things with what Greg had said he wanted. So he tried to find any text in which he suggested he wanted or needed anything. But the problem was, Fetch seemed to be doing more than accessing old messages or conversations. Fetch seemed to be listening in to Greg's life. How? Greg needed to talk to Hady and Cyril. He needed their help. Unfortunately, two days passed before he was able to convince Hady and Cyril to help him do what he, needed, what he knew he needed to do. He wasn't able to tell them about the neighbor's dog until after school. Predictably, they were freaked. Cyril wanted to forget it as soon as he heard it. Hady, though, wanted to see the stiff. So he followed. Ho so he followed Greg home, and they stood together in the rain, staring at the dead dog, which was now a wet, grisly pile of viscera and fur. I want to go back to the restaurant. Greg told Hady once they were up in Greg's room. Hady stared at him. After that, he waved a hand in the direction of where the dog dead dog lay. You want to go back. Well, want is probably not the right word, but I need to. I have to know what's going on. Hades shook his head and said he was going home. But Greg was persistent. He hounded Hady and Cyril relentlessly via text that evening and in person, the next morning and on the phone, the next afternoon, uh, until he convinced them to return to the restaurant with him. After school, they huddled together in the school lobby before racing through the rain to their bus. It will still be raining tonight, Greg told them. Fewer people out. Yeah. Whatever, Hades said. We're going to die, Cyril said. Greg laughed. We're not going to die. So why was his stomach doing somersaults? And why had his heart relocated to his throat? It was a little hard to get away from their families on a Wednesday night, but they managed it by saying they were going to do homework together at Greg's house. His parents, per usual, were out. His mum had taken a part-time job as a front desk clerk at one of the hotels. He wasn't sure what that was about, and he didn't ask. His dad was working late on his most recent build. I hate the finishing work, he'd complained that morning. That's when the client always gets nit nitpicky. The first time they'd gone to the restaurant, Greg and his friends had been armed only with a crowbar and flashlights. This time, they also each brought along kitchen knives, and Haley stuck his baseball ba bat in his backpack. It was just as easy to break into the restaurant the second time, actually even easier. The service door lock they'd broken hadn't been repaired or replaced, 
they just had to pull the heavy door open and slip through. Once inside, they flipped on their flashlights and shined them around. They started with the ground. Clearly, they all had the same idea. They were looking for footprints other than theirs in the dust covering the cracked blue linoleum floor. Unfortunately, they scuffed up the dust so much on their first trip, it was impossible to tell for sure whether anyone else had been here. Do we have a plan? Cyril asked when they moved out into the hallway. Greg noticed all three of them were breathing fast. His voice sounded breathless when he said, I think we should start by finding Fetch. They walked shoulder to shoulder along the hallway. It was much quieter in the building this time because the rain, although steady, was soft. It was foggy too. That tended to dampen sounds. So I found out something about the restaurant, Cyril said. His voice sounded too loud and too forced. What? Hedy asked. This was part of a pizza chain that closed down after something happened at one of them. What happened? Greg asked. I don't know. It took a lot of time to even find what I found. I just found a reference to it on a message board for people who like to explore abandoned places. Hedy came to a dead stop, his flashlight beam jittering out onto the floor in front of him. What? Cyril asked. Greg looked along the illuminated shaft of Hades' light. Cyril squealed. Greg couldn't blame him. Dog tracks came out of the pizzeria's eating area and headed toward the lobby. What the? Hades still hadn't budged. You did turn it on, Cyril said to Greg. Yeah, way to go, dude, Hades said. Before Greg could respond, a clatter and crash came from inside one of the closed doorways along the hall. Cyril squealed again. Hady dropped his flashlight. We need to see what's in those rooms, Greg said. Hady retrieved his flashlight and shined it in Greg's face. Greg squeezed his eyes shut and turned away. Are you out of your mind? Hady asked. Probably, but I have to know what's going on. I'm going to check it out. You don't have to if you don't want to. I don't want to, Cyril said. Fine. Greg dug the crowbar out of his backpack looked at the knife and concluded that he didn't have enough hands to hold a crowbar, a knife and his flashlight. So he got a firm grip on both crowbar and flashlight, then took five steps toward the nearest closed door. He noticed a small sign he'd missed the last time. It read control room. He stuck the, the crowbar under his arm and reached for the doorknob. Haley appeared at his side. Can't let you go in there alone, dude. He produced the baseball bat from his backpack and gripped it hard. Cyril scurried ho over. I'm not waiting out here by myself. Thanks, Greg said. He turned the knob, took a breath, and threw the door open. He quickly rearmed himself with the crowbar. All three flashlight beams sliced through the dusty blackness and revealed a bank of old computer monitors, keyboards, and what looked like control panels filled with dials and knobs. Nothing else was in the room. I don't see anything that could have made that sound, Hady said. Greg nodded. Let's try the next room. Wait. Hedy crossed to the nearest keyboard and tapped keys. He turned a couple of dials on the control panels. Nothing happened, he shrugged. Had to check. Cyril, gaining courage from his friend, came further into the room and tapped and pushed buttons too. Still nothing happened. Greg left the room and headed to the next closed door. As he figured they would, his friends followed. This door was marked security, and the room behind it was similar to the first one. More dated computer monitors looked back at the boys blankly. Nothing worked. One last closed door. This one was labelled storage. The sound must have come from in here, Greg said. He reached for the knob, but Cyril grabbed his arm. Wait! Greg looked at Cyril. You never told us what you wanted to do here. Why are we here? Yeah, dude, Haley agreed. You kept saying you had to see... See what? Fetch? What are you going to do to him when you see him? Interrogate interrogate him? Reason with him? He's a piece of machinery. Yeah, Cyril said. And when we left him, he wasn't in here. He wasn't in there. He pointed to the door. Greg didn't know how to explain why he needed to be here. I have to know whether someone else was here and is pranking us. And if it's Fetch, I want to see how it's working. He didn't bother explaining why he had to look in this room. Before they could protest again, he opened the door and he fell back into his friends. Cyril screamed, Haley gasped. Staring back at the boys in the gleaming streams of their lights were four life-sized animatronic characters. They were at least five times bigger than Fetch, who was about the size of a beagle. 
Greg recovered himself first. He aimed his light around the room. Every time the beam landed on something, Greg's breath caught. The room didn't just house the four characters, it was also filled with animatronic parts and character costumes, a whole wardrobe of them. Dozens of pairs of sightless eyes stared at them through the flashlight transected gloom. Or at least Greg hoped they were sightless. His friends hadn't spoken since they opened the door. Suddenly a raspy humming sound filled the room. The boys' lights skittered all over the space, searching for the sound's origin. One of the animatronic characters seemed to move its leg, and then something small, dark and furry shot out from behind it, arced toward the boys, barked, and then bolted out of the room, before they could do more than gasp in union. Whatever it was disappeared from view. Sybil shrieked and tore from the room. Greg and Haley were at his heels. This wasn't a thinking moment. That was Fetch that had leaped out of that room, wasn't it? Ha had to be. Even though Haley or Greg could have hit Fetch, or whatever that thing was, with the baseball bat or crowbar, Greg's brain didn't even consider that. Apparently Hades didn't either. They had just one conscious idea in their heads. Run. As they dashed down the hallway toward their exit, Greg tried not to hear the growling and chloric tapping that followed them. He also firmly closed the door on his mind when it asked to uh, when it tried to ask questions about how Fetch... No, no not going there. Get out, get out, get out. That was the only agenda. It took them only seconds to reach the door and squeeze through it, Cyril in the lead and Greg bringing up the rear. Was that a nip at his heel right before he pulled his foot through and shut the door? Not going there either. Without speaking, the boys grabbed their bikes. But just as they did, a whine behind them made them pause. With a shaking hand, Greg aimed his flashlight at the pizzeria. A wet, stray mutt trotted toward them. But when Cyril yelped in fear, the dog veered away into the fir trees that surrounded the abandoned building. It wasn't Fetch. Greg let go of his bike. I don't care, Cyril said. I do, Greg said. I want to find Fetch and figure out what, what he's doing. I'm going back in. I'm going home, Cyril said. Haley looked from Greg to Cyril and back again. Greg shrugged, albeit a little shakily, and headed toward the pizzeria. You can't go in there alone. Haley let go of his bike too, and followed Greg. He looked at Cyril. The real dog made that noise we heard, and probably the tracks too. Cyril hugged himself, then sighed. If I die, I'm going to come back and kill you both. That's fair, Greg said. The boys re-entered the pizzeria. They stuck close together as they went down the hall, closing the storage room door as they went past. Without speaking, they made their way to the dining area their flashlight beams zooming this way and that like spotlights. They crossed the room to the prize counter. They only got halfway there before they all paused. They didn't have to get any closer to see what they came to see. Fetch was no longer on the counter. Greg flicked his beam on to the floor, and then all around the prize counter. No Fetch. Maybe he fell behind the counter, Hades suggested, not sounding particularly convinced of his theory. Maybe. Since neither of his friends moved, Greg took a huge breath and shuffled forward. Let me know if you see anything, he told his friends. You've got your back, Hades said. Greg wasn't so sure, but he had to know if Fetch was there. Ignoring the trickle of sweat that ran down between his shoulder blades, Greg reached the counter and started tiptoeing on it. Or tiptoeing around it. Dude, Hades said, don't you think he would have heard us by now? Greg flinched. Good point, he laughed but the sound was more of a croak when it came out. So he rushed around the counter and threw his light beam everywhere it could reach. Fetch wasn't there. Greg turned and looked at his friends. Fetch is gone. What are you going to do? Cyril asked. I'm not sure, Greg confessed. Hady, ever the optimist, jumped in. What if you text, to, text him to stop or to leave you alone? He has to listen to you, right? It's in his programming. Tried that, Greg sighed. Didn't work. Could you give him an impossible task? Cyril asked. Something that could occupy his time forever. Like what? I don't know, I'm just trying to find an easy... There is no easy solution. Greg snapped. I just need time to think. As a unit, the boys headed back out the way they came in. Uh, no one suggested looking around more. Not even Greg. None of them spoke. They just went back outside. 
got on their bikes and pedalled hard into fog that was now so thick the restaurant disappeared into it. They pedalled in silence, only broken by the pattering rain, the swooshing sound of their wheels on the wet pavement and their panting breath. At the corner where they normally stopped to say goodbye before biking on to their re respective houses, no one even slowed. They all just headed for home. Greg understood. None of them were ready to talk about what had just happened. Greg wasn't sorry to get home and find his parents were still out. He was, in fact, relieved they didn't see him. When he looked at himself in the bathroom mirror, he was so pale his features almost disappeared into the blank whiteness of his face. A long, hot shower brought colour back into his skin, and it brought conscious back uh, thought. It's oh, sorry. It brought conscious thought back into his mind. Where was Fetch? Even though he knew Fetch would have had to leave the restaurant to dig up the spider and kill the neighbor's dog, Greg had convinced himself Fetch went back to the restaurant when his duty was done. The idea of him uh, being out there, somewhere, lurking, the hair on the back of Greg's neck prickled. Suddenly remembering his phone, he stared at the green sweats he'd left... Sweats? Green sweats he'd left crumpled on the floor. His phone was in one of the pockets. Oh, okay. Taking a long breath, he bent over and retrieved the phone, checking for the missed texts. Sure enough, there was Fetch's last, latest text. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, well, I don't hope to see you soon, Greg muttered. Greg didn't allow himself to ask all the questions that wanted to be asked after their latest encounter with Fetch. Instead, he decided to concentrate on school for a change, specifically on Spanish. Oh god, here we go again. <laughs> if he didn't get on top of his Spanish homework, he was going to fail the class. So, on Saturday morning, he texted Manuel, asking if he had time to, to help him. Manuel didn't respond. Greg shrugged. Okay, so he'd have to muddle through on his own. He opened his Spanish workbook and picked up his pencil. Then, he snapped his pencil in half when he realised what he'd just done. Oh no! Greg shouted. He jumped up. He had to get to... Crap! He didn't know where he needed to go. Greg grabbed his phone and called Cyril. I'm not going back there, Cyril said. That's not what I'm calling. Do you know where Manuel lives? Sure. He's about half a mile up the street from me. That's how we met. He gave Greg an address. Why do you need... I've got to go. Sorry, I'll explain later. Greg shoved his phone in his pocket and tore out of his house. Grabbing his bike, he ignored the steady mist and pedaled as hard as he could. Greg nearly collapsed in horror when he got to Manuel's house and saw that the front door was wide open. Was he too late? Right after he texted Manuel, he'd realised Fetch could have interrupt, uh, in, sorry, interpreted that text as instruction to retrieve Manuel. Given what Fetch had done to the neighbour's dog, Greg was afraid Fetch might punish Manuel for not being available to help Greg. Or worse, Fetch might kill Manuel and drag his body to Greg's house. There was no telling what the animatronic beast was capable of. Dropping his bike on the concrete driveway, Greg ran to the gaping doorway and peered into the tile-covered entryway of the small one-storey house. He broke out in a cold sweat when he saw muddy paw prints on the grey squares. Manuel? He shouted, taking a step into the house. Que pasa? <laughs> a voice called from behind Greg. A dog barked. <clears throat> uh, Greg whirled around. Manuel and a yellow Labrador were standing at the edge of a front yard filled with patches of grass and exposed dirt. The dog had a red ball in its mouth and its feet were muddy. Greg's heart, which had been trying to set a speed record, settled into a more normal pace. Hey Manuel. Hi Greg. Manuel's smile was friendly but confused. Not a surprise. How could Greg explain why he was here? Um, I, I sent you a text, but you didn't respond. Needed a bike ride anyway, so I thought I'd stop by. Cyril told me you lived down the street from him. I wondered if you have any time to help me with my Spanish. Manuel's confusion disappeared. Sure. Sorry about the text. I left my phone inside. I can do it now, if Oro will let us. I think that means gold? Does that mean gold in Spanish? I don't know. Uh, the dog next to him barked. Greg, so relieved that he'd imagined danger that didn't exist, grinned at the dog. Hi, Oro. Want me to throw the ball? Oro wagged his tail, but didn't move. Manuel laughed. 
he understands Spanish. Say, traem la pelota. Traem la pelota. Oh, gosh. Traem la pelota. There you go. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the A right because it's got an accent. Anyway, Greg repeated the command. Oro brought him the ball. Greg laughed. Maybe I don't need your help. Maybe Oro can help me. Manuel laughed too. And for the next hour, Greg forgot all about Fetch while he played with Oro and improved his Spanish. The rest of the weekend passed without any disturbing incidents. And when Monday came, Greg was in a great mood. He was all about his most recent triumph, getting Kimberly as his lab partner. He'd intended it. It had happened. And after his most recent intention with Fetch seemed to seemed to thwart him, it looked like Greg was sorry, was actually learning to use the zero point field. Score. Greg and Kimberly had their first meetup after school the next day in the science lab. Every team had been given a set time to use the REG machine Mr. Jacoby got for his for, for their experiments. Greg and Kimberly were second to use the machine. Their assignment was to attempt to control, with their minds, the zeros and ones generated by the machine. Both were to focus their will on either zeros or ones. Greg took zeros and Kimberly took ones. For a total of 10 minutes each, they were to record their results, and then they were supposed to write a paper about some aspect of REG research and how it impacted society. Greg had thought he'd have to be the one to suggest a topic, but Kimberly beat him to it. Sitting cross-legged on the floor after they used the REG machine, Kimberly said, I have an idea for the paper. She pulled out her phone and tapped at it. Greg stared at her hands. She had the prettiest hands. Today, her nails were bright blue. They matched the tight blue sweater she wore. He tried not to stare. Are you listening? I'm sorry, what? Even though Greg had known Kimberly for seven years, he was pretty sure he'd never said more than two words to her at a time. Whenever he had the chance to talk to her, his brain drained down his legs and puddled in his shoes. He'd gotten her as a partner now, but now was he going to talk to her? I said, I think we should write about how REGs influence big world disasters. Wow, she knew that. If he hadn't been in love before, he sure was now. Yeah, he agreed. That's perfect. You know about it? She looked up at him. Greg still sat in his chair but now he slid down onto the beige tiled floor so he could see her better. Stoked by her idea, he forgot to be nervous. Yeah, I've been following the way REGs have been used to study the power of thinking for a couple of years. That's Gucci! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot that they, they reference Gucci in this story. That's great. That's Gucci. Kimberly gave him one of her full smiles. He grinned back like an idiot. He was so excited about her paper topic that he wasn't as bummed about the fact that Kimberly had done better with the REG machine than he had. No matter how much he concentrated, his machine's results were barely above a normal random readout. I tried to talk to my parents about it, Kimberly said. They're pretty open-minded, but mum said it was too out there and dad said the machines were probably being set up to get the results the people wanted, but they're not. Kimberly leaned forward, her eyes bright. Greg couldn't believe she was as into this stuff as he was. I know, Greg said, leaning in too. And did you know, they get spikes before big sporting events. He hesitated only a second before saying, Do you know about Cleve ba Baxter? Kimberly blinked. No, who's he? He was an interrogation instructor for the CIA, and he taught classes on using the polygraph machine. Okay, Kimberly put her elbows on her knees, clearly focused on what he was saying. He couldn't believe he had her full attention. He tried not to let himself be distracted by her peaches and cream perfume. So, what about him? Kimberly prompted. Greg cleared his throat. Well, he started using the polygraph machine to do experiments on plants, and he discovered plants can sense our thoughts. My mother sings to her plants because she says it makes them grow faster. Greg nodded. They probably do. That's why I was surprised my mum didn't believe the REG stuff. I think it freaks people out, Greg said. Kimberly nodded. So, is there any more about this polygraph guy? Yeah, so Baxter experimented with a plant's reactions to his actions. Like, he burnt a plant and got a reaction, but not just in the burnt plant. Nearby plants reacted too. And then he just thought about burning the plants, and the second he had that thought, the polygraph recorded a reaction in all the plants. Like the plants had red his mind. 
Whoa. Greg nodded so hard he felt like a bobblehead doll. Yeah, I know, he grinned. Most people didn't believe Baxter when he published his results, but he kept experimenting, not only with plants, but with human cells, and he proved that cells can sense thoughts. They have consciousness. Kimberly twirled a lock of her shiny hair with an index finger. So if cells have consciousness, then why is it such a leap to think our brains can influence a machine? Exactly. We should include that in our paper, Kimberly said. It's good stuff. Yeah, I thought it was so cool that I decided to do my own experiments. My uncle got me a polygraph machine and I started trying things with my plants. It actually works. They know what I'm thinking. Well, at least the simple stuff. Wow. Yeah, I've been trying other things too. Greg hesitated. Should he tell her? Like what? She asked. Greg chewed his lip. Oh, why not? He scooted closer to her and lowered his voice. Do you remember what Mr. Jacoby said about the zero point field? That it means no all, that it means all matter in the universe is interconnected by subatomic waves that connect one part of the universe to every other part. Yeah, sure. Well, I read about the field over the summer. And when I read it, I got really excited. I read that researchers are saying this field could explain lots of stuff no one could explain before. Stuff like Kai and telepathy and other psychic abilities. I have a cousin who's psychic, uh, <laughs> uh, Kimberly said. She always knows when there's going to be a test at her school. Kimberly laughed. I've been trying to get her to teach me how to do that. Greg grinned. Then you'll get it. Get what? Well, I have some good stuff in my life, but there's so much I hate. Like my dad and, well, just stuff. So I figured I could use to, I, I could learn to use the field, you know, communicate with it, tell it what I want and get it to tell me what to do. So I've been practicing on my plants, seeing if they'd respond to my intention. And then I started just concentrating on things I wanted and seeing if I got any ideas, you know, like guidance. Yeah. Kimberly slowly nodded. I get what you're trying to do. She wrinkled up her perfect nose. The problem is, well, she shrugged. I just wonder if trying to get the field to work is like a monkey trying to fly an aeroplane. He's going to crash and burn before he can figure it out. Greg tried not to let her see that her words felt like a kitten, kick in the gut. She obviously did see though. Not that you're a monkey, I mean, I just mean quantum stuff is hard. I like it too, and I've tried to read about it, but I don't get it. Not really. Hey! Trent White burst into the room. You two smashing face in here or what? <laughs> I don't know why I gave him that really strong British accent. <laughs> uh, Kimberly blushed deep red. Shut up, Trent, Greg said. Shut up yourself. Your time's up. Our turn. Uh, Trent gestured toward his project partner, another school athlete, Rory. Greg still couldn't believe they were both in advanced scientific theory. We're done. Kimberly scrambled to her feet. She and Greg left the room. Let's get together over the weekend to talk more about the paper, she suggested. Sure. After Greg got home from school, he texted Hayley and Cyril, asking them to come over. While he waited, he looked at the latest text from Fetch. Too easy. What's too easy? Greg responded. AOTA. All of the above what? Greg asked. 411. All of the above information was too easy. What did Fetch mean? Was he talking about Greg's conversation with Kimberly? Was he saying that Greg was making the zero point feel too easy? And why did Greg care about the opinion of an animatronic dog anyway? He wanted to ignore Fetch, but then Fetch, Fetch texted R-E-G M2, or Me Too, I think. Fetch then texted a link to a website that sold small REGs. Greg didn't understand what Fetch meant by REG Me Too. Did M2 mean Me Too? Did that f mean Fetch was saying he wanted an REG too? Or was he saying he was an REG? Or like an REG? Greg frowned and texted back. Thanks. He figured whatever Fetch was saying, he should stay on Fetch's good side. Hedy and Cyril came over and bought pizza. Surprisingly, Greg's parents were home, 
but they were caught up in some intense discussion and they both said okay when Greg asked if his friends could come over with pizza. The boys spent their first 15 minutes wolfing down pepperoni pizza and guzzling coke. When Haley burped loudly, Greg decided it was time. We need to talk about what happened the other night. Do we really? Cyril asked. Yeah, Greg said. Fetch is out there somewhere. Well, now you're just being a moron, Haley said. That's what bothers you? That he's out there somewhere? Yeah, he's out there, for sure. Fetch is an animatronic, and you obviously managed to turn him on. But how about the fact that Fetch dug up the spider for you? Or the fact that he killed a dog for you? Yeah, there's that, Greg agreed. I think we should destroy it, Haley said. I think we should stay away from it, Cyril said. Yeah, but will Fetch stay away from us? Greg asked. Haley glared at him. You're the one who activated it. Greg threw up his hands. I didn't even know what I was doing. Well, you need to figure it out, Haley said. You're the smart one. Yeah, Cyril agreed. You sound like you're mad at me, Greg accused his friends. Cyril looked at his tiny feet. Haley said, well, you are mad at me. What did I do? You're the one who wanted to go there in the first place, Cyril said. Greg opened then closed his mouth. He got up. Fine, you two can head home then. I'll take care of it. Haley and Cyril stared at him, then looked at each other. Whatever, dude, Haley said. Come on. He got up and gestured for Cyril to follow. An hour later, wearing threadbare sweats and an old tie-dyed t-shirt lying on his back in bed in the dark, Greg said to the ceiling, I need money. If he had money, more money than he could get from babysitting anyway, he could get whatever he needed for his experiments. He could set up his own consciousness project. Then he'd know what to do about Fetch. Greg grabbed his phone. Over the summer, he'd read an article about this 13-year-old entrepreneur who set up a home business and was making tons of profit. Greg was 14 and he was smart. Why couldn't he have a business? He thumbed in a search how to make money fast. He spent the next hour skimming through make money at home sites. By the end of the hour, he was frustrated, confused and tired. So he got ready for bed. Just before he laid down, he picked up his phone and sent Dare a text. I need the magic finger of luck. Can you teach me how to make money? Dare didn't respond. Greg figured he was probably asleep. Dare usually went to bed earlier than Greg did. Uh, before he turned off the light, his phone buzzed. A text from Fetch. Good night, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams to you too, Greg responded, ignoring the chill that skirted down his spine. He frowned, bothered by something, but he wasn't sure what it was. He was so tired, he wasn't thinking straight. He couldn't keep his eyes open. So, he closed them, and he was asleep immediately. When Greg woke up, it was still dark out. He erupted from the bed and blinked frantically to focus. His last text! What had he been thinking? Idiot! Greg grabbed his phone and deleted his text to Dare. Then he called Dare. No answer. He pulled up Dare's landline number and called it. Even if Dare was asleep, that phone would wake him. No answer. What should he do? Greg had no way to get up to, to Dare's place on his own. It was too far to bike. No buses ran up there. How could he get to Dare and warn him? A ride. He needed a ride. From who? No way could he ask his parents. He thought about Mrs. Peters, three doors down. She was always nice to him. Maybe... Greg tore off his PJs and pulled on grey sweats and a navy blue hoodie. He grabbed his phone and ran out of his room. He wasn't sure how he was going to explain to Mrs. Peters why he needed a ride at... What time was it? He checked. 4.30. Well, he'd just have to figure it out. In his stocking feet, Greg took the stairs two at a time. Inside the front door, he stopped to tug on his rain boots in the entryway. Then he threw back the deadbolt and flung the door open. He started to charge through the door, but then he looked down. His legs went out from under him and he crumpled to the ground. He started to leave, covered his mouth, oh start, sorry, he started to heave, covered his mouth and looked away from what lay on top of the welcome friends map. Oh, Matt, sorry. I don't know why I'm talking about maps. <laughs> Looking away didn't help though. The image was indelibly 
indelibly (laughs) etched into his retinas. In his mind's eye, he could see Dare's thick finger, the base torn and bloody, part of the bone jutting through the gore. The finger was dusky and had tufts of light hair. The blood was bright red. Even just in memory, the details were excruciating. Greg even noticed that the blood had congealed before the finger had been dropped on the mat because the white M wasn't bloody. Greg? What are you doing down here? Greg's mum was coming down the stairs. Greg didn't think. He snatched up the finger and stuffed it in the pocket of his hoodie. Grabbing the door frame, he pulled himself to his feet and shut the door. I think I was sleepwalking, Greg said. Lame. But he was too out of it to come up with something better. Then he noticed his mum was crying. What's wrong? he asked. Her eyes and her nose were red. Her mascara was smeared. Her cheeks were wet. She wore nothing but her pink fuzzy robe over a white frilly nightshirt. She wiped her cheeks and sank down onto the third step from the bottom of the stairs. What's wrong? he repeated. He rushed to the stairs and sat next to his mum. She took his hand. I'm sorry. It's not the end of your... (laughs) It's not the end of the world. I'm just shocked, is all. It's your Uncle Darren. Greg stiffened. You won't believe this, his mum says, sobbing. He got attacked by some kind of wild animal. It tore off his finger. Greg couldn't breathe. He looked down at his hoodie pocket. He put his hand over it, feeling the ring still wrapped around the grotesquely ripped base. When Greg had seen the finger, he'd have known it was dares even without the presence of the onyx and gold ring. But the ring? That, more than the exposed bone and reins, was what had dismayed him the most. Now his eyes filled with tears. He cleared his clogged throat and managed. That's terrible. He's all scratched up too, mauled. He's been airlifted to the hospital. I just can't believe this. Greg couldn't comfort her. He was too busy realising. Oh no, 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 he groaned. His mother, not understanding, wrapped her arms around him. It's okay, really. I'm sure he'll be fine. He'll probably make a joke out of losing his finger. She burst into tears again. No, 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 Greg repeated. It was like a mantra, like he could say it enough and it would make everything stop and go back to the way it was. Disengaging himself from his mum, he touched the hoodie pocket and said, I need air. He ran to the front door, threw it open and careened down the front stairs. It wasn't raining, but if it had been, he wouldn't have cared. He had to get away. He couldn't face it. He couldn't accept what he'd done. Because he'd done it. Obviously, he had done it. Greg didn't know where he'd been planning to go when he left his house, but before he could go anywhere, he was stopped in his tracks. Was that? Yes, it was. Under the shore pines clustered near the back of his yard, next to the marron grass at the edge of the dunes, Fetch sat. His eyes glowed red in the now pre-dawn light, and his ears were tilted forward, as if in question. Greg was so angry and upset, he didn't even think about running away. Instead, he grabbed the baseball bat from his dad's pile of sporting equipment and took one step towards Fetch. Then another, and another, and then he was sprinting full out. Fetch stood, eyes bright. He looked at Greg. If Fetch had been a real dog... Greg would have thought this was cute, but Fetch wasn't a real dog. He was an animatronic killer made to look like a dog. Greg wasn't going to let the seemingly happy look stop him. When Greg fetched, uh, when Greg reached Fetched, oh gosh, when Greg reached Fetch, he didn't hesitate. He swung the bat at Fetch's head. The first strike split open the top of Fetch's head, revealing a metal skull and ripped wires. Sparks flew as Greg wound up for another swing. What did you do? Greg screamed at the Fetch. Fetch's mouth hinged opened. What? Fetch's mouth hinged opened in what looked like a silly grin. It's a weird sentence. Uh, Greg swung the bat and whacked Fetch's mouth. Metal teeth sprayed out and more sparks sputtered at the end of the wires that hung through the mouth opening. But Fetch was still looking at Greg with what looked like an eager gaze. Stop it! Greg shrieked. Swinging the bat in in a wide arc, he brought it down on Fetch's head as hard as he could. 
Metal clanged, more sparks flittered out into the wet dune grass, and Greg kept up his assault. He pounded on Fetch with the bat. Once, twice, three times, four times. Finally, Fetch's face was pulverized. But Greg wasn't done. He raised the bat again and battered what was left of the machine. Soon, the remnants of the animatronic killer didn't resemble anything but a small pile of industrial debris. Still, Greg didn't stop, not until he had blisters on his palms, and he was chomping at the sea air in frantic, wide-mouthed gulps. Finally, he dropped the bat. Greg fell back on his butt in the sloppy, wet dunes. He stared at the pile of metal, hinges, synthetic fur and wires as he sat, catching his breath. The surf was loud, its rhythmic roar like the chant of a million angry men. To Greg, it was the sound of judgment. It was his accuser. How dare he think he knew enough about the field to think about luck and expect to get money? And what was he thinking when he texted Dare about the magic finger of luck? He was the one who'd been wrong. How could he blame this on Fetch? Fetch might have been like an REG machine that he seemed to be reacting to Greg's thoughts, but he wasn't an REG machine. Was he? Greg didn't understand what was going on, but he thought that Fetch was responding to more than just his texts. Somehow, Fetch was observing Greg's actions, and maybe he was even reading his thoughts the way Greg's plants did. Fetch wasn't the zero-point field, but he was part of it. He seemed to be acting like he was the field's dog or something, getting whatever the field thought Greg wanted. Whatever Fetch was, it was Greg's fault that Dare got his finger torn off. Greg, you out there? Greg's mum called. Greg looked at the destroyed animatronic. Greg? His mother st started down the steps. Greg and the debris were partially hidden in the marrow grass, but if his mum came into the backyard, she'd see them. Greg looked around and spotted a dep uh, uh, and spotted a depression under the driftwood log covered with Fetch's teeth. He quickly shoveled all of Fetch's parts into the hole and called out, Coming! His mum wanted Greg to know Dare would be in surgery for a while to repair damaged nerves and sew up his lacerations. It would be some time before they could go visit him, so she was going to work until then. She hugged Greg before she left. His dad was already gone. As Greg went inside, he realised he'd left the house without his phone. What if someone had been trying to reach him? Someone. Let's get real, he meant Fetch. Had Fetch sent him a text before Greg had spotted him? Yeah, Fetch had texted. Or oh, Fetch had texted. Greg discovered when he reached his room. Fetch had asked Greg how he was going to use the magic finger of luck. This question put Greg into a fetal position on the bed, and it brought on a fresh wave of tears. Kimberly's words played on a repeat track in his head. He's going to crash and burn before he figures it out. Crash and burn. Crash and burn. Crash and burn. Greg sat and uh, Greg sat and up and yelled. No! He grabbed one of the books from his nightstand and he fired it at the biggest plant in his collection. The plant went flying off the shelf and dirt exploded into the air. Greg snatched up another book, threw it. Another book, threw it. He did this over and over until every one of his plants was on the floor and dirt was everywhere. He breathed in the musky scent of the damp earth. He laid back down and tried to calm his breathing. This brought the tears back, but that was okay. He laid there and cried until he fell asleep. When he woke up, the sun was dropping in the west. It was mid-afternoon. As full consciousness returned, he remembered everything. What a complete tool, he berated himself. What had he been thinking? Did he really believe he could figure out what no one else, not the CIA or the universities or the experts, had figured out? If it could be done, wouldn't it have been done? Such an egotistical little twerp he'd been. He realised now he, how little he knew, and that meant th that whatever he thought he knew, whatever he thought had been the right thing to do, could have been exactly the opposite of that. Was he really guided to the restaurant, or did he come up with the lame idea himself? And if he was guided, what guided him? He'd assumed he was doing something to get him what he wanted, but when his phone rang, he froze. Then, he realised he was being stupid. Fetch didn't call, he texted. Greg looked at his phone. It was Hady. Hey dude, you okay? You weren't at school. Greg stared at his destroyed plans. He'd forgotten all about school. He'd forgotten all about life. Yeah, something happened to Dare. What? Is he okay? Dude, I'm sorry. Greg could hear Hady talking to someone else. 
Cyril says he's sorry too, Haley said. Thanks. Can we do anything? Not unless you can do magic. Sorry to disappoint, dude. Yeah. Hey, I'm not sure it will make you feel better, but Kimberly was looking for you just now. Greg sat up and finger combed his hair, catching himself and rolling his eyes. It wasn't like she was in the room. Really? Totally. She said you have a good paper idea and she's ready to work on it. Right, the paper. He slumped. He'd been so excited about that and now he didn't even want to think about the topic. Still, if it meant spend spending time with Kimberly, he noticed Haley was talking. What? Sorry. I said, after, listen after listening to you moon over that girl forever, it would be nice to see you with her. It hasn't been forever, just since second grade. Had it really been that long that he'd loved Kimberly? Whatever. Yeah, it would be nice to see her. Well then, don't miss your chance. Call her and get busy on that paper. Win her over, dude. Greg grinned. Then he frowned. He felt wrong to feel hopeful after what he had happened to Dare. I gotta go, he said. Sure. Let us know if you want to hang out. Okay. Greg put down the phone and went to take another hot shower. He stank of sweat and salty sea air. When he got out of the shower and got dressed, he picked up the phone to call Kimberly. That's when he saw a text from Fetch, sent five minutes ago. It said, we'll retrieve. No, Greg groaned. Greg shoved his phone in his pocket and tore out of his room. He galloped down the stairs and out to the dunes. Would Fetch even be there? When he reached the edge of his yard, he slowed. He was almost afraid to look, but he had to. He edged into the dunes and he looked under the driftwood log. Greg's legs gave out. He sank to his knees in the wet dune grass. Although a, a few small screws, metal pieces, wires and a hinge were strewn out under the log, the vast majority of the scraps were gone. Gone. Greg looked around. The only footprints he saw in the sand were his own. But the sand did tell a story. Around the driftwood, the wet, the wet sand was grooved with ragged drag marks. At least a dozen smears stretched out from under the log. And then they angled toward each other until they formed one messy drag mark that ended at a flattened clump of dune grass. Greg struggled to his feet and backed away from the dunes. Turning, he galloped into the house and up to his room. There he sank to the floor and put his head in his hands. Snapshots of the, late, of the last several weeks flashed through his head. The spider, the dead dog, the torn up dead dog, Dare's severed finger. All Greg had wanted was some luck. He didn't want his uncle's finger, but Fetch obviously took things literally. Greg had no doubt Fetch was active again. How? Greg didn't know. Didn't need to know. He just did know that Fetch still worked. So if Fetch interpreted his request for luck as a need to rip off Dare's finger, how exactly would he retrieve? And more importantly, what or who was Fetch going to retrieve? Especially now that Greg had beaten him up. No. Greg jumped up and stuffed his phone in his pocket. Shoving his feet into black running shoes, he flew out of his house. Kimberly lived about a mile away, further south, on the same street he lived on. It would be a straight shot. Grabbing his bike, Greg pedalled hard. Of course the wind was picking up again, and it was coming from the south. His lungs were screaming by the time he'd gone halfway to, his ho to her house. He ignored them and pushed on. He had to reach Kimberly before Fetch did, if it wasn't too late already. When he reached Kimberly's house, he leaped off his bike and prepared to rush up to the door, but he caught himself when he realised the house was dark. No cars were in the driveway. No one was home. Kimberly had mentioned her mum usually picked her up after school, and they often stopped to run errands on the way home. If Kimberly was still at school when Hayley called, Greg probably beat them here. Greg leaned over to catch his breath and picked up his bike. Carrying it to the bushes at the edge of Kimberly's yard, he, he hunkered down to wait. He considered searching for Fetch, but he didn't know when Kimberly would get home, and he could miss her if he was off looking for Fetch. He couldn't risk it. He waited. While he waited, he tried to calm himself with yoga breathing. It didn't work. He was so tense by the time the sun started going down at 4.30, he felt like his limbs would break if he tried to unbend them from his crouched position. He figured he'd better try to move now before Kimberly got home. Just as he started to stretch out his legs and stand, he spotted headlights coming up the street. He bent low again. The car went past, but before he could straighten, another came after it. This was the one. A dark blue SUV pulled into the driveway. The passenger door opened and Kimberly, wearing jeans and a cute green top that matched her eyes, 
bounced out of the car. She was chattering to her mother as she did. I think if we put the oregano in, it would be good. Maybe with basil too, her mother said. Tall and slender, with a pretty face and short greying black hair, Mrs. Bergstrom was in her mid-sixties. Uh, when they were in second grade, Kimberly told him her mother was 51 years old when Kimberly was born. I was a miracle baby, Kimberly said. I figured that means I should be nice to my parents. She laughed her musical laugh. Greg knew Kimberly's dad was even older than Kimberly's mom. He was retired. He'd owned a couple of hotels in Ocean Shores, and he'd sold them the year before. He mostly plays golf now, Greg overheard Kimberly tell a friend. Greg had met both of the Bergstroms. Although Mr. Bergstrom was a little grumpy, Mrs. Bergstrom was nice. But would she listen? Greg, re Greg prepared to step out of the bushes and tell Kimberly if she was in danger, but he realised how insane his story was going to sound. Maybe if he could, just, he could talk to just her, she could convince her parents to listen. Before he decided what to do, a black sedan pulled in behind the SUV. It crunched over gravel strewn across the asphalt driveway, and Mr. Bergstrom got out. The wind picked up speed when, uh, just when Mr. Bergstrom's feet hit the ground. It blew off his red baseball cap and Kimberly skipped after it. Thanks, sweetie, Mr. Bergstrom called. He smoothed down thinning white hair and hugged his daughter. The ocean wasn't as loud now as it had been that morning when Greg was running in the dunes. Was it seriously just that morning that he had found out about Dare and tried to destroy Fetch? It, it felt like a year ago at least. Even though it wasn't as loud, the ocean's insistent murmur drowned out what Kimberly and her parents were saying as they walked toward the house. Greg started to rise again, still not sure what to do. Just as he rose, Mr. Bergstrom's hat blew off once more, and he strode after it. The hat landed right in front of the bush Greg hid in, and Mr. Bergstrom spotted him. Hey kid, what are you doing in the bushes? Mr. Bergstrom's voice was strident and sharp. Greg squared his shoulders and stood up. He had to try to warn them. Hi, Mrs. B uh, uh, Hi, Mr. Bergstrom, he said. Who are you? No, wait, I've seen you. Greg, what are you doing here? Kimberly called out from her front walk. She came to, uh, she came toward Greg and her dad. Mrs. Bergstrom followed. Um, Kimberly, I know this is going to sound crazy. What's going to sound crazy? What's the meaning of this? Mr. Bergstrom snapped. Greg took a deep breath and dove into his explanation. Kimberly, you're in danger, like serious danger. I think, well, I think someone of uh, something is going to try and kill you. What? Mr. and Mrs. Bergstrom erupted into unison. Uh, Mr. Bergstrom's tone was rough and outraged. Mrs. Bergstrom's tone was a high-pitched shriek of fear. Kimberly said nothing, but her eyes had widened. Kimberly, you know what we were talking about? The REGs, the plants, the cells, the shared consciousness, the guidance... She nodded. I have no idea how to explain this, but part of the guidance I got was that I know how I know what was inside that abandoned pizzeria. So I got Cyril and Haley to break in there with me with you what? Mr. Bergstrom spotted. Greg ignored him. And we found this animatronic dog that's designed to sync up with your cell phone. Mr. Bergstrom tried to interrupt again, but Greg talked louder and faster. I was curious, so I poked around at it, and I couldn't get it to work. Or at least, I thought I couldn't get it to work. But apparently I did, because it's been texting me and doing things for me. At first it did helpful things, but then it started doing things I didn't want to do. It killed a dog that bothered me. Kimberly, a dog lover, Greg knew, sucked in her breath. He shrugged at her. Yeah, I know, it was awful. I mean, this was a horrible dog, but still, it was a dog. And, and the way it was killed, and anyway... I, then I was doing some, I was wanting some luck, and my uncle had this magic finger of luck, and I wished that I had that too, and then I found his young man, Mr. Bergstrom shouted. Craig ignored him and talked even louder. I found his finger, and so this afternoon I said, well, I said I wanted to be with you, and now I'm afraid Fetch is going to, young man, Mr. Bergstrom yelled. Greg stopped because, well, what else could he say? That's when he noticed Mr. Bergstrom put a cell phone to his ear. Yes, could you please send an officer to my home? Some crazy teenager is stalking my daughter. I want him arrested. Greg looked at Kimberly. She mouthed, sorry. He shook his head. He'd failed again. When the police officer questioned Greg about breaking into the restaurant, Greg kept telling himself Kimberly would be okay. She was fine now, and if Fetch was following what was going on through Greg's cell phone, he'd surely know Greg wanted Kimberly to be left alone. 
I'd forgotten all about that old pizzeria, the middle-aged cop said when Mr. Bergstrom reported Greg's break-in. Is it still there? Is it still there? Greg thought. Was the place like Brigadoon or something? I have no idea what Brigadoon is. <laughs> it's a funny name though. Uh, when the police officer put Greg in his SUV and took him to the police station, Greg kept telling himself Kimberly would be okay. Her parents would be on guard. Fetch wouldn't be able to retrieve her. But no matter how often he told himself everything would be fine, he dreaded going back to his house. It took two hours for the police to process him and question him. It took another two hours for the police to locate his parents and another hour and a half for them to get to the station because they were both in Olympia. What if Fetch had gotten to Kimberley in that time? His parents finally showed up at the station. His mother red-eyed and his dad pissed off about, well, everything. The police had decided to release Greg into his parents' care. He'd be free, which also meant he could keep an eye on Kimberly. As soon as his parents went to bed, he'd sneak out and go watch over her. He'd do that for as long as it took him to find Fetch and figure out a way to deactivate him. Greg almost couldn't bear to get out of his dad's pickup when his dad pulled it into the garage. Dragging his feet, Greg reluctantly opened the car door and stepped out onto the concrete. He cautiously approached the stairway leaning up to the front door. Then he steeled himself and looked around. Everything seemed normal. Kimberly's body wasn't under the house or on the front mat. He nearly fainted in relief. What the hell's wrong with you? Greg's dad asked when Greg sagged against the stair railing. Nothing. When Greg and his parents entered the house, Greg's dad grabbed Greg's arm. Greg gritted his teeth. I'd say I was disappointed in you, his dad said. But I haven't expected anything good from you in years. Greg's mum sighed. Stephen, Hillary. Greg ignored them both and went up the stairs to his room. Peeling off his clothes as soon as he was in the darkened space, he went to take yet another shower. He stank again. Not only did the hard bike ride and the panic to save Kimberly make him sweat buckets, he'd sat in what smelled like dried urine in the cop's SUV. He thought the hot shower might bring him back to life. He had to get the energy to go to Kimberly's house again. His bike was still in the back of his dad's pickup. The policeman had stuck it in his SUV when he took Greg in, and he'd given it back when he and his parents left the station. But when Greg got out of the shower, he was wiped out. He looked at the time on his phone. He also checked for texts. Nothing. That was good, right? Maybe he could take a nap before heading to Kimberly's to be sure she was okay. Heck, maybe he'd been wrong about the whole thing. Maybe Fetch was retrieving him a snack or information he hadn't even realised he requested. Maybe there really was nothing to worry about. Greg pulled on a yellow t-shirt and a pair of grey flannel sleep pants. Then he threw open the bathroom door. Barely containing a scream, Greg stumbled away from the door and fell to the tiled floor, his mind struggling to accept what he was looking at. There was something wrapped in a sheet, laying across the doorway. As he stared, the once beige sheet was turning a deep, dark red and it glistened wet in the room's muted light. Who was under the sheet? What was under the sheet? Greg couldn't get himself to move so he could find out. Greg didn't need to look any further. He knew everything he needed to know. The phone on Greg's bathroom counter vibrated. He couldn't help himself. He picked it up and looked at it. Fetch had texted, see you. I think that's it. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I like that. Uh, it's a it's a pretty average story, I'd say. Uh, let me know what you think about this story. I think it's really good. Uh, I think the the ending could have been a little bit better, and it's kind of weird that Fetch is like, see you, like he's gone now. I feel like it could have had a different ending, even though it was kind of like, whoa, so Kimberly was was killed. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a good story, I think. Um, I don't know, it's, yeah, I like, I like the concept of it a lot, where, like, Fetch is a, what is it, a zero-point field, and, like, <laughs> it's, it's, like, very scientific, and, like, Fetch would, like, act genuinely, like, fetch whatever Greg wanted, uh, it, it seemed a little bit kind of surreal, but I guess that's what you're gonna get with these stories, uh, but I liked it. I, I, it was a cool concept. I think it could have gone further, but it didn't. But uh, it's it's nice, yeah. So uh, let me know what you thought of this story. Uh, and yeah, that's that's all I really got to say. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe. We're going to be doing Lonely Freddy next. 
This is the second to last story I need to record, so I'm excited about this. Uh, so yeah, tune in next time. Subscribe, like, do all of that. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.